Good morning, good morning. Good morning. Quite morning. the morning. I really appreciate y'all, like seriously, each and every one of you, because I can see and name each and every one of you, um, for making it a priority to endure the rain, to be present in what is now our second installment of our three-part Black Heritage Month Distinguished Lecture Series. Um, my name is Carrie Bolin, and I serve within the Division of Institutional Equity, Diversity, and Justice. And in recognition of this critical Heritage Month, we've built out these conversational community spaces to create dialogue and deep and really reflection about black experiences from black viewpoints. So in doing so, we've been really blessed to have some remarkable scholars um, come and facilitate those narratives. So before we begin by introducing said scholar, um, I'm gonna call a knowledge facilitator, um, I wanna pause in recognition of the stolen lands that we have the privilege at PCC to reside on. They belong to the community known as the Gabrielino Band of Mission Indians of the Sheshikuwanga Village and Quiche Nation. I also want to acknowledge that much of what we know of this country today, including its culture, its economic growth and development, has been made possible by the labor of enslaved Africans and their descendants who suffered the horror of the transatlantic tra um, trafficking, chattel slavery, and later on dehumanization through segregation and Jim Crow laws. Let's pause. Thank you. I am thrilled about today's facilitator, Dr. Ju uh, Julianne Malveaux. She has swam here, literally and figuratively speaking, to be with us today, and I just appreciate her patience and the grace she's extended. Um, we hope that this is one of many visits from her, um, but she serves as an um, uh, economist, author, activist, television and radio commentator, entrepreneur, and educator. She earned her PhD in economics and currently serves as Dean of the College of Ethnic Studies at California State University, Los Angeles. She she was the 15th president of Bennett College for Women in Greensboro, North Carolina, serving from 2007 through 2012, author of multiple publications, her most recent titled, Are We Better Off? Race, Obama, and Public Policy. Dr. Malvo is especially concerned about the wealth gap and is connected to our nation's history of, and its connection, excuse me, to our nation's history of racial economic envy. As a member of the National African American Reparations Commission, she is a force to be reckoned with and someone that keeps it real, extra real. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Julianne Malvo. Well, good morning, all. Good morning. I'm really delighted to be here uh, for any number of reasons. Uh, first of all, you all are a feeder to Cal State LA. So I'm hoping that some of you are interested in taking your associate's degree and bringing it to Cal State LA. Uh, the College of Ethnic Studies includes uh, Pan-African Studies, Asian Asian American Studies, and Chicano Latino Studies. We also have a certificate for a post back certificate in Ethnic Studies that we hope, hope that um, teachers and others will be using. We have master's degrees in both uh, Pan-African Studies, which is new. The deadline for applying for that master's is, I think, March 15th, and the CLS master's is two years old. And we've had, uh, I think, about a dozen graduates. We have a really nice class that I think is going to be coming out this year. Where I, one of my charges that I'm very excited about is to uh, create a Department of American Indian and Indigenous Studies. And I was able to get uh, authorization for two hires in that area. So, Two is not enough for a department, we need at least three, but it's a step in the right direction. And so it's an exciting place to be at a time like this, especially when crazy people don't believe that they need to know the truth. So therefore, they don't like ethnic studies. They don't like teaching truth. Uh, they have passed laws that say you can't make anybody feel bad about history. Well, what do you think enslaved people feel? I mean, we all feel good, we having parties. Um, so in any case, it's great to be here, and I hope that some of you all will choose to engage with us at Cal State LA. We have an Ethnic Studies Summit happening March 4th and 5th, where we will have a children's book fair, a film festival, and a couple of other things, really to just lift up ethnic studies. I'm the dean of only the second college of ethnic studies in the nation. The other is uh, San Francisco State University. So here in California, we're well ahead of the get curve. As, as you know, uh, we, I just had a long conversation, blessedly, with Dr. Shirley Wepper, our Secretary of State. Yes, yeah, she's amazing. 
Um, and she appeared on my radio program on Monday. I still do radio out of DC um, at 6 a.m. because it's nine o'clock DC time. But she was real. Okay. Thank you. I'll tell y'all though, if he didn't fix the mic, you would hear me anyway. Uh, I almost, I got mugged one time in New York. I was on 32nd Street. And so I just laid down because, I mean, the dude had a gun. I'm like, I just laid down. Well, my thing was, I didn't want to get shot and they have one of those crotch shots where they see your underwear. So, you know how, you know, people get shot. They, they, so I'm like, no, let me close my legs, lay down and, and try, to, try to die like a diva. And, uh, and then I started screaming and the brother said, I ain't shot you yet. <laughs> But I screamed so loud, the police heard me a block away. I, I did damage my vocal cords, but I did scream like, uh-uh. I ain't going out like that. <laughs> you know? So I can be heard almost anywhere. But thank you for fixing the mic in any case, so I don't have to holler. Um, but anyway, we are living in challenging times. And Dr. Weber and I and so many others are talking about how we begin to resist. And so, Dr. Bowen, we will be reaching out to you. I want to do a national PAC to defend ethnic studies. But I just learned, well, I already knew this, but I learned again, a national PAC is almost impossible. You actually have to incorporate it in every state, in all 50 states. So there's another way to do this that I'm working on with some folks now to figure out ways that we can, basically, these people who don't want to know the truth, we need to put an arrow on them and make sure that other people don't, and the people who have to be organized are parents. Because, par you know, black parents, brown parents, we're not getting the, tr our kids aren't getting the truth. You know, I was, when I was, I guess it was maybe the fifth grade, they had two, but of course this was a long time ago, a really long time ago, but still, I don't think higher education, I mean, K through 12 books have improved, because you only have two or three companies who are doing these books. But they had this brother in the book look like he had escaped from Uncle Ben's rice box, and um, the sister who had a bandana on her head, I think she was supposed to be Aunt Jemima. And the, in the book it said, and the slaves were happy. This was a textbook. Blessedly, my dad was one of the first um, school superintendents, black school superintendent, assistant superintendent in San Francisco. My mama was a social worker. I inherited, mom passed a couple years ago, I inherited a thousand books that she had in her library. I'm still trying to figure out what to do with them. So there was no question that when I call the teacher a liar, I was punished for calling the teacher a liar, but not for the content. My mom said, you could have figured out a nicer way to say that. I'm like, really? I hadn't thought about it. <laughs> anyway, ASALA, which is the association. OK, brother, brother technician, can you help me? How do I change my slides? What do I need to do to change my slides? I, I probably just need to hit one button, but I probably am not aware of the button. Help us on the way. Hmm? Help us on the way. Help us on the way. Hey, sweetie. Okay, there we go, that's good. Okay, thank, thank you. So the Association for the Study of African American History, Life and History, ASALA, is the organization that was founded by Dr. Carter G. Woodson. He was only the first, the se he was the second after African American after W.B. Du Bois to earn a um, PhD from Harvard. He was passionate about black history. And with his passion, he established ASALA it, did, it then was the Association for the Center of Negro Life and History, and of course we moved a long way from that. But in any case, um, they, they every year do a theme for Black History Month. And the theme this year is Black Resistance. So it, this is a great time to have it. I'm gonna excuse myself and get something out of my. So anyway, the theme was black resistance. And as I said, it's more important ever than ever to have a theme about resistance because what are we dealing with? We are dealing with uh, the post edit era. I don't curse in front of young people, so I don't call the name of the 45th president. I just, because that's a curse. I just assume, I just assume say, you know, in that era, what we know about history is every time there were gains for black folks, then there were, guess what, losses. And so somebody made it okay to curse at us. Somebody made it okay for us to be abused. 
somebody walked down, came down an elevator or escalator and started dissing Mexican people. And that was his introduction to the politics of the United States. So given that, we have to fight back. But we should not be deluded that this is the first time we've had to fight back. We've had to fight back since we've been here. So resistance, black resistance is a theme. Resistance is opposition to a racist and predatory capitalist status quo. Now what is predatory capitalism? It's capitalism on steroids. Basically, capitalism is about paying factors of production, land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurial ability, or the secret sauce. The land gets rent, labor gets wages, uh, capital gets interest, and the secret sauce is like entrepreneurial ability or whatever. But basically, they're supposed to get paid based on the effort they put in. Predatory capitalism is capital attempting to take everybody else's share. So when you look at the way this, the most recent recovery went, capitalists got more money in recovery than people at the bottom did. In fact, people at the bottom lost money while in the midst of the pandemic, capitalists gained money. We kept hearing, oh, people are doing so poorly. Well, the people at the top were not doing poorly. They figured out how to make money from COVID to our detriment. If we look at today what's happening with gasoline prices, the gas companies are posting record profits. Record profits, but gas prices keep going up. Now they're saying supply chain, but a lot of us who are economists say they're taking advantage of a situation. It's not just supply chain, it's some other things going on. So we have to think about that and say, what are we resisting? We're resisting the status quo, and that's racist, it's predatory capitalist, it's homonormative, it is, um, or it's heteronormative rather, and it, it's anti-feminist. And that's the work of resistance. So we can go back in our history, okay, I think I did the right, again, go back in our history and look at uh, resistance. One of the most powerful things that uh, was written in the early 19th century was David Walker's Appeal. David Walker was a free black man. He wrote a manifesto that said black people rise up. The thing was so powerful that basically there was a price on his head, not only a price on his head, if you were found with David Walker's appeal, you could be incarcerated, re-enslaved, whipped. You had a series of um, punishments for anyone who had this manifesto in their hand because it was that powerful. It moved people. You know, people were like, yeah, that's a thought. But remember, we could not legally in like 15 states read. In North Carolina, the law reads such. To teach a slave to read is to excite dissatisfaction to the detriment of the general population. To teach a slave to read is to excite dissatisfaction. Excuse me? And if a black person taught an enslaved person to read, they could be whipped up to 30 times, slashed up to 30 times, and re-enslaved. If a white person taught a black person to read, they could be fined up to what today would be about $10,000. It would be, and they could also be lashed. There are very few laws that allow white people to be lashed. But if a white person chose to teach an enslaved person to read, he or she could be lashed. Their property could also be seized. So while people have to say, you know, ignorant people say, if you want to hide something from a black person, put it in a book, that's just myth. We were desperate to read, and so desperate that we risked death in order to read. Resistance. Everybody here, I'm sure, knows about Dima Vesey, who a successful up to a point revolution, up to a point. There were, you know, we just saw five black police officers beat Tyrese Nichols to death. And I'm sure they, I think this is the tip of the iceberg. I'm sure there's some more people that they haven't gotten yet. But people say, well, how do the black, how do black men do that? Well, if you swim in dirty water, you're gonna get dirty. If you swim in racist water, you're going to get racist. It does not matter whether you're black or white. If you swim in racist water, and police culture is such that it's distrustful of people. So how Denmark, Vesey, and Nat, Nat Turner, both of whom were uh, basically betrayed by black people, who were Massa's friends, uh, they, thought, they thought Massa was their friend. They did not understand. Um, but they were betrayed by black people who drank the Kool-Aid 
who believed the hype, who thought that they did not need to resist. Some of these folks thought they were going to be treated specially because they betrayed other black people. And that was not the case. It's just like on the African continent when people co collaborated with the slave catchers because they thought they were going to be special. Well, they were the last one on the ship. Because, yeah, you turned all your brothers in, so now we got you. So in any case, we look at Denmark Vesey and Nat Turner, though, the powerful thing about their stories is their resistance, is that they didn't take it. They didn't believe that they were powerless. And they organized people. They didn't have weapons. They didn't have a lot of weapons. But they had energy. And they were bold. They were bodacious. Now, I think I got in trouble one time when I said something along, along the lines of, yeah, and they killed some white people. Right on, right on. Um, and somebody said, she advocating killing white people. I'm like, no, I advocated killing enslavers. Now, but anyway, we, we see where that is. My personal shero is Ida B. Wells, uh, because she, uh, I'm blessed that my sorority, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, I see my Cabot brother back there, um, but I got an award one year for the, the Ida B. Wells Award for my writing, and I was like, I couldn't have thought of a more humble moment. But Ida B. Wells was a, had been enslaved, was born enslaved, she went to Russ College in uh, Holly Springs, Mississippi. Uh, her parents died uh, over from yellow fever. When she was just a teen, she had four or five other brothers and sisters. She took them on. She was teaching and doing whatever she could. She moved to Memphis and became a journalist and began to chronicle injustice. Uh, her chronicling of injustice was heightened by the fact that she was put off a, a train. She had purchased a first class ticket they took her money, she sat in the first class cabin, and then when they crossed a certain point, the conductor told her she had to get off or go into the coach section. And she said, no, the coach section was where they had cattle and, you know, been smoking, and it was just unpleasant. So she chose uh, to fight, and she was arrested, and uh, she challenged the railroad. She won in the lower court, but the higher court she lost. But that basically heightened her sense of injustice, which she already, already had a heightened sense. Then what had happened was she um, had three friends. Tommy Moss was the main one. He was her godchild's dad. And Tommy Moss, in Memphis, there's an area called the Curve, which was kind of like the hood, um, where white people really managed commerce. The store that was owned by this white man was nasty. Black women would go there, white men would talk under their clothes. This white guy had been, and I always forget his name, I should always write it down, but I don't want to lift him up. But anyway, he was um, arrested five or six times for selling liquor. Um, he was just a bad apple. Uh, so Tommy Moss and two of his friends decided, we'll start our own store. So they started the People's Grocery. And the People's Grocery was a competitor to this man's store. And of course, the black people, Tommy Moss was a postman, which is about as high as you could get as a black man at that time. He was a postman, he was a deacon in the church, and taught Sunday school. Very highly respectable. He was a dad. He had small children, two small children. Um, in any case, long story short, uh, his store was really kicking the white man's behind in terms of profits. Two little boys got into a fight over marbles. Marbles. A white boy and a black boy. Um, the white boy ran down to the white man's store and said the brother had stolen his marbles. The white man went to the black man's store with guns, a bunch of them with guns, the, trying to shoot it up. That was their excuse. You know, that was their excuse. It wasn't real. That was their excuse. And so they went, and the brothers had guns too. Some of them had just come from the Spanish-American War. They had guns. So bang, 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 white guy got shot. Did not kill, but shot. The next day, the sheriff came back to arrest the black men, and within two days, they had been lynched. Ida B. Wells chose to chronicle those lynchings. There's a, you can even get it on um, if you have a Kindle. It's called uh, Lynching Chronicles. And, um, and, and it's, it's, it's chilling and it's deep about why people were lynched. But anyway, her whole life was about resistance. After she wrote an article, an editorial that cracks me up, you know, they were lynching black men on the pretense that black men were raping white women. So she read an article that said, well, you know, if, you, if, if your women's virtue was that loose, 
one has to raise questions, not about the black men, but about their virtue. Um, she, I mean, there, at that time, there were lots of consensual interracial relationships that white folks did not want to acknowledge. And so when they happened, basically, the black man was considered a rapist. Never, the white women often were afraid to even say anything because if they had been caught sleeping with a black man, they too might have been lynched. So, but Ida B, this article she wrote, caused white folks to go crazy, and they ran her out of Memphis. She owned a newspaper called the Memphis of Hill, and they ran her out of Memphis, and she then decided to go on the Thomas Fortune at the New York Age, offered her a job to travel and to chronicle lynchings. And that's what she did. The footnote on lynchings, most, many people want to talk about lynching as a function of race, no, of, of sex. But they really, in my mind, and I'm, this book that I can't seem to finish, to me it's about economic violence. See, if you go back to look at the story of Tommy Moss, he threatened white people economically. You know, he had a store that was a competitor of their store. And the sad ending of the Tommy Moss story is that after he was lynched and his two friends were lynched, the white man who started the mess was able to acquire his store and all of its inventory for eight cents on the dollar. So that, that so the, really, it was not about anybody having any sex with anybody. It was about, let me take your money. And that's literally what they did. Uh, the other footnote on the um, economic violence piece is that whenever black, especially men, but sometimes women, but whenever black men accumulated, there was a backlash to their accumulation that often ended up in lynching. In South Carolina, a brother, um, no, was he in, no, he was in Mississippi. A brother owned 425 acres of what they call good cotton land, um, worth today a couple million dollars. Um, he was, according to the newspaper, according to a white woman, he was a wealthy Negro and arrogant. That's how they describe it, wealthy and arrogant. He basically just was not taking anybody's stuff. So he went to uh, the general store where you so sold stuff, and he had cotton seed. So he wanted to sell cotton seed. He was standing in line. Before him was a white man. The man offered the white man 95 cents a pound for his cotton seed, then ordered the brother 85 cents. My brother said, I want the same thing you offered him. I'm not going to sell my seed for less. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. The brother said, I'd rather put my cotton seed in the damn river, and he used the word, than to allow you to, to cheat me. Well, cursing a white person was against the law. So he was arrested as he left the store for saying damn. See, if I ever had that rule on me, I'd have been arrested I don't know how many times, but I got a lot more to say than that. But in any case, uh, they arrested him. Well, this brother was so bad, bold and bodacious, the fine was $15, he reached in his pocket and said, here. <laughs> yeah, I, I got this, here. And so that did not work out too well. They uh, then lynched him. They hung him from a tree and left his body there for, well, until it deteriorated. Meanwhile, his people, his wife, his family, he had kids, um, they were hounded off the property, and the two white men who brought charges against him for saying damn um, were able to become the executors of his estate. And yeah, um, the judge allowed that. And so then you have people who say there's no structural racism. Give me a break. But in any case, uh, the family dispersed based on the fact that they had everything taken from them. But again, brother was lynched not because he raped anybody, on the pretense that he cursed at a white man, but because he had too much property for them. Of course, we could talk about Tulsa. I mean, the Tulsa story is amazing to me because they basically erased all the newspaper articles of the Times. You can't find hardly any references, but you do find a few. The governor of Oklahoma appointed a commission to find out why Tulsa occurred. Here was the reply. Too many N-words had too much money. And it was, the N-word was not Negro. So yeah, in, in an official docu government document, it says too many had too much money. And literally, that's what it was about. I was the, had the privilege of knowing a sister who was a Tulsa survivor. She died in 20, either 18 or 19. 
um, and there were a group of us, my contemporaries, about five of us who were her buds. She called us her little buds. Um, I met her when we were both speaking at Syracuse University. And um, I like to walk. And so I had, and I, I had the cutest little jogging outfit, but I forgot my shoes. So I'm sitting there, I'm in her room, her suite, fussing. I'm like, I don't have my shoes. If I don't get a walk, I'm going to be a mean black woman. And she said, I don't like mean black women. Go in my room and get my shoes. So she had shoes, and they went with my outfit, which was very good. And um, so she always called me her soul sister, S-O-L-E, because we shared souls. Uh, her name was Dr. Olivia Hooker. Um, so if you ever want to, she was the first black woman in the Coast Guard. She wanted to go to the Navy, but the Navy would not accept her, so she went into the Coast Guard. And there's a building at the Coast Guard Academy named after her. But what Dr. Hooker, she was actually in Tulsa when it happened. She was hiding under the table in her mother's kitchen, and she tells about how she looked out the window and saw all these armed soldiers and said, why are, are, is our country fighting us? Because the soldiers didn't come there to, to defend black people. They came basically to fight black people. But she said that leading up to Tulsa, white folks had been stockpiling weapons because they were waiting for something. So just like the, mar the little boys with marbles, basically in Tulsa, the story was a, a young man named Dick Rowland. He was 19 years old, and he was a shoe sign boy. And there was a young white girl, 19 also. No, she was 17. She was younger. And her name was Sarah Page. And she was an elevator operator. At that time in downtown Tulsa, the only place that a black person could go to the restroom was at the top of this building. So you had to get on the elevator. Now, there is some interesting evidence that Dick Page and Dick Rowland and Sarah Page knew each other because there was a, a group of orphans. He was an orphan, and as she was she, and they hung out. They, they did all kinds of stuff they had no business doing, probably. You know, they drank, they stayed out late, they gambled, whatever, whatever. So there's some evidence that they knew each other. But in any case, something happened. The elevator kind of jostled, which you know, those old elevators. And she, he touched her, and she screamed. And she probably screamed out of alarm, not out of anything. And a white man saw it and said, Dick Rowland raped Sarah Page. She never, they could, even after it was all over, she would never press charges. She said it didn't happen. But the newspapers actually had an article called To Lynch a Negro Tonight. That was a headline, To Lynch a Negro Tonight. And they basically said Dick Rowland had raped Sarah Page. Well, the, the black men in Tulsa, this is 1921, after World War I, brothers had guns. So the brothers went down and said, no, they were planning to lynch him. And backstory, backstory, backstory. Two years before, they had lynched a white man, highly unusual, but who had killed um, a taxi driver. So they lynched the white man, and then the, <laughs> the white newspaper had an article that said, if you can lynch a white man, you can surely lynch a Negro. So they set it up like, okay, we, now we get... We lynch a white man, we can lynch a Negro. Excuse me? That's what I said, excuse me? <laughs> but um, in any case, uh, the brothers went down to the jail and said, you will not lynch this guy on our watch. There was some jostling, and the next thing you know, a white man was shot. Not killed, just shot. Brothers should have had better aim. I didn't say that. Um, but in any case, um, that started what happened in Tulsa. Uh, the rumor was that black people had armed themselves, that they were coming to kill white people. There was never any intent to kill white people. They wanted to just defend their property, defend their homes, defend people. But, you know, what had happened was, um, essentially, that we lost um, over 1,200 homes, millions of dollars of property. Uh, we had, in t black Tulsa, they, people used to say, you could hear a, you hear a dollar turn over there. We owned a theater. The first auto repairman was a brother who actually was so brilliant, he bought a car, and he took it apart and put it back together a couple times so to teach himself how to repair autos. So he had an auto repair shop that even white folks had to come to. They destroyed that. They destroyed the hospital that black people could not go to, so black doctors built their own. They destroyed that. Um, they destroyed uh, the AME church. Um, just on and on and on. But this was really about economic envy, when the title is, too many N-words have too much money. But the, uh, the fact that they had the money, 
that's resistance. The fact that they were willing, to, despite knowing what the story is, that they were willing to accumulate and to fight back, that's resistance. So our history is a history of resistance that we have to own, embrace, claim, and enjoy. Uh, historically, I mean, there are so many people that we can lift up. Wanted to lift up, of course, Mary McLeod Bethune, who started Bethune, at that point it was Bethune College, with a dollar fifty cents, a dollar fifty cents, and she was able to go and raise the money to build it, then merge with Cookman College or Cookman Normal School, something to make it Bethune Cookman College, and then to build it to Bethune University, Bethune Cookman University. The reason why this is important is because well, there are many ways to resist. Education is one of them. So the founding of historically black colleges, uh, all the challenges that people had to go through, is about resistance. And when we look at the, you know, we can talk about educational resistance. We could talk about, of course, Brown versus Board of Education, which understand with Brown that that was a culmination of a series of other uh, court cases. There's a brother, Charles McLaren, in Oklahoma, who sued for the right to go to law school at the University of Oklahoma in 19, I think, 48. The thing about Dr. McLaren, they actually allowed him to matriculate, but he had to sit outside the classroom. So he could come to class, but he had to sit outside the classroom. They set up a desk for him outside the classroom because apparently white folks couldn't learn with black people in the room. What kind of limitations must they have that you cannot learn with black people in the room? But there are many other cases like this, and so all of these cases are really about resistance. And we can talk about the story, it's a very sad story, but we must lift it also of Oswain Sweet. This happened in Detroit. He was an African-American physician who moved to want to buy a house in a decent part of town. It wasn't upscale, really. It was a mixed kind of working class area, but it was mostly white. Um, it was better than the hood, though. And so, and he was a wealthy doctor. He bought this place. Um, white people started doing all kinds of stuff, including shooting at his house on the regular. So he um, got himself a gun and chose to fight back. And um, he shot, if not killed, a white person. It's who was on his property shooting. So this is called self-defense. But he ended up um, being tried for murder. He was found not guilty. But the tragic part of it was, first of all, his wife died um, of consumption, uh, probably stress. And then he basically descended into alcoholism. Um, he spent everything he had to defend himself, so he had nothing left. And his wife had passed, and I think she was pregnant at the time. So, lost his, so But again, the issue is that he was willing to resist. So when you look at the theme for Black History Month, Black Resistance, our history is just replete of stories of our resistance, rich, rich stories of our resistance. And so we have to just embrace that. We have to embrace the many ways our people have fought back and the ways and what we paid for it. So anybody who tells you they're tired of resisting, you're standing on the shoulders of people who resisted. And we have to continue that. So moving closer to, to the contemporary resistance, this is not forever ago, but this is contemporary resistance. I always lift up Dr. Height. She was a mentor of mine and a friend. I got on her nerves, I'll admit it, because she would always say to me, Miss Malvo, could you be a little more quiet? And I'd be like, oh, hell no. <laughs> she, she'd look at me like, where did we get this crazy woman from? But Dr. Height's resistance, and that's part of the story that we must tell, is we all resist in different ways. You know, she was a gentle giant. I ain't. And that's okay, because you know we all have to resist in the ways that are true to ourselves. But Dr. Height met with every president of the United States from Franklin Roosevelt to Barack Obama, um, Democrat or Republican. Uh, she was seen as a um, conduit to the black community. One of the issues about her resistance is that she, while she was vocal about it a little bit, she didn't talk a lot about the resistance she had to have to our brothers, black men who were sexist. But she used to tell this story, which would crack me up about how, especially President Johnson would have meetings with bl black leaders. And so she'd, um, it was the big six, you know, Urban League, NAA, blah, blah, core, 
SCLC. And she would always be invited, but when they seated, she would never get to sit by the president because the brothers would just sit by the president. So one day, LBJ said, I need to get you sitting next to me because the, the media would always get the pictures of whoever the, the brother of the moment was, and she would never be in the picture. So he said, I'm going to arrange for you to sit next to me. So he, she sat next to him, and then one of our brothers put his head up between them, so she still <laughs> couldn't get her picture. And she would always talk about that, but also very gently. She really never raised her voice at people. Um, then we want to talk about Dr. King and his resistance. And people like to compare Dr. King to Malcolm. And that's a, in, in, it's an incorrect comparison. Again, different ways to resist. But the thing about Dr. King, there are two, quotes, two King quotes that I love. One is his Nobel Peace Prize acceptance speech. He said, I have the audacity to believe that people everywhere can have three meals a day for their bodies, education and culture for their minds, peace and freedom for their spirits. I have the audacity to believe. Audacity is a resistance word. So, but you have the nerve, you have the temerity. Ain't nobody gonna turn me around. But the other one is, um, she, he said, um, bottom line of it, he said, we look at the resources of this nation, and you have to ask who has them and why. Who, ha who owns the oil? Who owns the iron ore? If the world is two-thirds water, why should we pay water bills? I, because that, that's an economic statement about the distribution of wealth. And that's, like, that's one of my favorite, favorite, favorite King quotes. I will lift up in terms of contemporary re resistance, the Reverend Jesse Lewis Jackson, my big brother. I chair the Push Excel board, which is the education arm of Rainbow Push. And Reverend, from the time he was a kid, he uh, basically led a protest at the library when he was 15 years old because black people could not go to the library. So resistance is just part of his DNA. We will not accept BS will not accept unequal treatment. We will fight, we will fight, we will fight. And you can see throughout his career, the fighting and the whole issue about education and distribution for wealth. Uh, these days, one of the things that um, Dr. Bolin mentioned, my participation in uh, NARC, the National African American Reparations Commission. We have been working, there, but people have been working on reparations since we got here, literally. Uh, there was a woman who, um, sued her owners in Massachusetts in 1792 because she was suing them for her retirement. She was old and she, they had tried to let her go and she sued. Um, and then we could go through history and find all kinds of reparations type lawsuits. But NARC is really about ensuring that, see, because the, the origin of the wealth gap is the, basically the expropriation of our labor. So reparations are about a way of making that right. And so when you look at that whole situation, what you have to say is that H.R. 40, which is legislation that was passed, that was not passed, that was introduced first in 1989 by Congressman John Conyers, uh, who was a champion of reparations. So he introduced the legislation. When he passed, Sheila Jackson Lee, Congresswoman um, from Texas, has picked it up, and she's been a very effective leader Today, we have more than 200 um, co-sponsors of H.R. 40, but we don't have enough. We need half of the Congress, which will be like 218 out of 435. We were pushing President Biden to do something, which he did not do, with an executive order to implement H.R. 40. But you know, too many people are too afraid of truth and too afraid of white people. Biden isn't going to do it because he says his white constituents wouldn't support it. Well, they mad at you anyway, you know. So if they mad at you anyway, why not do something, you know? I mean, if you will be mad at me, let me give you something to be mad about, you know. This is gonna be mad, generically mad. So in any case, HR 40, um, in, with in NARC, and there's another group called Reparations Rising. We have folks who are basically fighting to make sure that if this legislation is not passed, that there's an executive order. Now, I don't care if Biden does it the last day he's in office. He needs to do it. And I don't know that he can win again. I'm not supposed to talk about politics. But anyway, uh, I don't know if he can win again because his behind is old. I mean, this, I mean, just say it, dude is old. Um, and that's all right, I ain't mad at him. Trump old too. Now, they say old with sense and old without sense. See, there's a difference between being elder and just being old. I mean, elders have wi wisdom. Old folks just been here a while. 
And so, you know, I, I think Biden has, is viable, but I don't know. But in the, re, in the reparations tip, other people we would mention, you know, my colleague and brother who convenes NARC is Dr. Ron Daniels with the Institute of the Black World. I would mention Areva Martin, who is working in Palm Springs, where black people were burned out of their homes in the late 1950s to make room for those casinos and resorts. Burned out, of their, and the fire department sat and watched. Just sat and watched. So Areva is working to get reparations for them. I've been working with her. Uh, in fact, I'm supposed to be down there now, but I'm here with y'all. Uh, I always tell people I would love to clone myself, but see that I'd be doing the work and the other one would be having all the fun. So I'm able to just do what I have to do. But Areva is one of the leaders. One of the people that you should know, especially younger people, is a sister named Robin Rue Simmons out of Evanston, Illinois. She has passed the first local reparations legislation in Evanston. Now it's imperfect. They're using their marijuana money to give people money. They're doing it um, with a lottery. And so I think the first, I don't know how many, it was the first 18 people or something who um, qualified for the money got uh, $25,000 to help them with housing. So you could either use it as a down payment, use it to improve your home. And the rationale was they saw the redlining in Evanston up to a point. And so it's like, we have to make these people whole. Now, a lot of people who didn't get pulled in a lot of were mad and a lot of people, but it's a step in the right direction and an acknowledgement that something is owed. Um, and so Cam Howard is another person I would mention. He led, leads Reparations Rising, which is an organization that tries to put all the reparations groups together. Robin started um, an organization that basically has pulled together local reparations. So the last meeting we had, which was in December of last year, we had over 40 people who were representing states and cities who were supporting reparations. There's also a mayor's group called I think it's something like mayors in support of reparations. Asheville, North Carolina has been a place where reparations has been acknowledged. They haven't come up with anything yet. But what people are looking at is that when you continue to talk about the wealth gap, you have to talk about why you have it. And the fact is one of the reasons you have it is because of predatory capitalism, people taking our stuff. Um, so moving on, when we talk about re resistance, I often want to remind people that we can talk about movements but we should also talk about our personal stake in resistance. There are those who would have us be pitiful, mean, downtrodden, angry. Resistance is basically living and breathing and thriving in the force of this racism. It's not allowing people to take your joy. It's essentially hanging out, doing stuff, um, continuing to just be the light in the world. That's, you know, when I think about Dr. Height, her favorite song, this little light of mine, let it shine, let it shine. And she would always like to sing that at events because she always said everybody has a light. Well, we cannot let racism extinguish our light. We cannot let ignorance basically, you know, extinguish our light. And so the personal resistance is embracing joy. It's organizing in the face of obstacles. My favorite biblical verse is 1 Corinthians 16, verse 9. I'm going to do great things and there are many obstacles. And the preaching is in the end. See, when you say obstacle, you say, I'm going to go, I'm going to get my doctorate, but it's going to be so hard. Mm -mm. I'm going to get my doctorate and it's going to be so hard. In other words, I accept the fact that it's going to be hard when I decided that I was going to do this. If you don't want any resistance, just go to bed and don't get out. Because the only resistance you'll have will be the sheep. The sheep will be your resistance, and that's about it. But if you understand that progress requires struggle, Frederick Douglass, power can seize nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. Those who want freedom without agitation are like those who want the ocean without its mighty roar. And that's the story that we must tell. Uh, so we want to survive and thrive in the face of resistance. Um, black joy is resistance. I'm going, to come, I'm going to come back to a couple things, or I'll deal with them in questions, but this is a poem that my pastor read. I belong to Metropolitan AME Church in Washington, D.C., and we do morning meditation at 7 a.m. Eastern, which means 4 a.m. here. But I do get up to do it, not every day, at least, tw at least twice a week. And um, yesterday, he read this poem by Lucille Clifton, who's just an amazing woman. Won't you celebrate with me what I have shaped into 
What kind of life? I had no model. Born in Babylon, both non-white and woman. What, I, what did I see except, to, what can I see to be except myself? I made it up. Here on this bridge between sunshine and clay, one hand holding tight, my other hand, come celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me and has failed. Black resistance. Thank you. She encouraged me to become a Delta. The first time I met Dr. Hyde was in an airport, and I forget the city, and the plane was delayed, and I was raising hell. And, <laughs> and Dr. Hyde said, young lady, you can't do anything about the plane. Come sit by me. Oh, wow. So I came and sat with her, and she told me this and told me that, and she said, do you belong to a sorority? And I said, no. I said, I don't do that bougie-ish. And, <laughs> and she said, well, do you know the history of this? And my mother was a Delta. And she said, but long story, but anyway, she was horribly hazed and um, was not uh, active after a point. But um, she, all my sisters are Deltas. I have three really? sisters. Wow. Yeah, we're all, we're all Deltas. And anyway, so Dr. Hyde, I just began to work with her. Dr. Hyde was funny. So she might call you up and she, at like six in the morning, Miss Malvo, I need you to do blah, 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 blah. Click. You didn't even have time to say no. Just, <laughs> just like, okay, I guess you're going to have to do it. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I edited a book for her uh, about, what was that book called? I forgot. Um, in the eight, no, there was another one that we had. A, it, was oh, okay, a, okay. it was a group okay. of essays that scholars okay. did. Okay. And no, Dr. Hype was a bomb. And she was a like, character. Oh. She was a character. She was funny. She would say interesting things. You're just like, did she say that? <laughs> uh, she didn't say ego. She said ago. So that person had a little too much ago. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah. And another thing I wanted to ask you, I just read an um, article. Janisha, wait. Okay, I'm sorry. Just so everybody can hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm like, because I'll talk your ear off. Um, I just read an article um, from Georgetown's economic um, institution about um, the cost of inequality. Mm -hmm. And one of the, uh, my job here, I'm a research analyst. And so we look at um, income levels of our students once they get out of, you know, the school and they've, um, you know, received their degree or certificate. And so one of the things that's troubling is that we'll look at income levels of our black and our um, Latinx students, and they're significantly lower than our white and Asian students. And so yesterday I was at a conference and I asked somebody, I said, what can we do? You know, that, that's, that's a big problem. And so he was sort of like, he's a black economist as well, but I won't, you know, name him. Um, you can. I know, I know. <laughs> and he said, well, we have to, you know, put pressure on the employers. Well, you don't, you can't put pressure on a private employer. Like, you know, what can you do? Like, I yeah. mean, that's a hard question, but um, it's a problem because we tell students like, hey, you know, complete, you know, complete. But once they get into the workforce, they experience the racism that we all have. And it's, well, you know, we have laws on the books that are not enforced that are anti-discrimination laws. And there are penalties to using those laws. I mean, if you sue for discrimination, I mean, I'm thinking of uh, Meritor, what was the sister's name? She sued Meritor Bank for sex discrimination. In fact, it's the first sex discrimination case on the books. And it was Meritor Bank, but I forgot her name um, at the moment. Any long, long story short, it was, a, it was a, almost a decade of worth of litigation she didn't work in the banking industry. I mean, she finally did win. Um, but anyone who chooses to take on yeah. predatory capitalists understand that there are risks involved. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there are laws of the books that are not being enforced. I mean, what do we do? I, I mean, one of the things that I think black and brown people need to understand is that you have some power. So a lot of times, and I've seen this, someone gets a, an offer, a job offer. I'm going to pay you $100,000. Someone said, oh, good, I'm going to Disneyland. 
The most powerful words in the English language in terms of negotiation are, is that all? Is that all? Because if they have board, they might give it to you if they really want you. But if you just say, oh, gee, thank you, that's it. You thanked them. And then you go back and find out that other people were making more than you in the same job. And they will say, you accepted the job at that rate. There it is. So we have to be better negotiators um, about around our stuff. And we haven't been taught to do that because all too often we're too grateful for the opportunity without looking at how we maximize the opportunity. So it, it, how, we, how we deal with the wealth gap, that's why I'm so passionate about reparations. It's one of the ways we deal with it. Um, and the, the wealth gap and the income gap, but uh, there are laws in the books that are not enforced uh, organizations like the NAACP Legal Defense Fund and their others will fight these things. But in the very short run, if you're just an individual, it's really hard to say, how do I fight this? When I went to work, I'm making, you know, I mean, I have a sibling who actually sued the state of Washington. And she got a whole bunch of money, but guess what? She never got another job in, yeah. in, in that, the area that she was working in. Again, so that's the conundrum. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, question for you. Um, I know that you had, you, you participated in the Sixth Pan-African Congress uh, back in 1974. And I'm curious, given your long history and involvement in the reparations, debates, discussions, initiatives, where you see this conversation about adults? Um, American descendants, African, was it African American? African descendants of, this, American African descendants, of American descendants of slaves. And I'm wondering how you square that with your own sort of Pan African history in, in the Pan Africanist movement, uh, given mm -hmm. where that sits in this conversation about reparations. Well, good question. Uh, ADOS has threatened my life. Okay. Um, <laughs> when I testified before uh, Congress, in 2019, June 19, 2019, about reparations, they, I had to get security. I actually had to hire a retired police officer to accompany me um, because, the, the, and they were just angry that I was testifying because they said I was not a real economist. They put someone else out as a real economist who was a classmate of mine at MIT. Dude used to copy off my paper. But, uh, <laughs> but in any case, I think they're rabid. I think they're crazy, and I think they, they do not look at the big picture. Absolutely. Uh, we do not, you know, American descendants of slaves, well, let's be clear about the slave trade. It was a triangular slave trade. The boat might have stopped in Barbados and then it came here. Absolutely. Might have stopped in Cuba and then came here. We all were taken from the African continent. And the, to begin to split these hairs, I think, is just, it's counterproductive. Absolutely. And it allows the melanin deficient to basically have us all fighting when the goal is to deal with the wealth gap. Now, I've, you know, I've been with folks that I respect and they want to say, well, what if we've been here forever and somebody just got off the boat? I mean, those might, let's, let's just pass HR 40. Let's pass HR 40, let's have our internal conversations, let's figure it out. But I, I, I don't have any love in my heart and I basically, anybody who loves black people, I love. But I don't love fools. And uh, those folks, I mean, they've done some horrible things to activists. They, with the California legislation um, and the commission we have here in California, they have gone after some of the members of the commission in the vilest of terms, called one sister a bed wench. I mean, be, they don't know anything about her business. They just feel that's an insult to black women. And again, the misogynoir that some of these folks indulge in, is they're not gonna call a brother out of his name, but they're gonna call Sister Barrett. Come on now. So I had no love for him. Thank you. Hi, um, I really appreciate your notion of um, what you say, predatory capitalism, mm -hmm. but I'm just wondering, um, would you say that capitalism by nature is just like inherently predatory, just sort of based on its origins? So that's my question. That's a good question. At some level it is, but you know, I'm an MIT trained economist. So from that perspective, sometimes your origins are a little to easy, difficult to shrug off. What I would say is that capitalism done right is not wrong, although still oppressive. But capitalism, we have legislation that has allowed predatory capitalists to run amok. 
as an example, we just saw this train wreck in um, Palestine, Ohio. Um, three, um, that man, who used to be the president, basically relaxed the regulations that forced train companies to put in all kinds of safety measures. So, and what's their argument for getting out of that safety? Well, it costs us too much. That's predatory capitalism on steroids. In other words, it costs too much so we can take human life. Regulations that prevent you from polluting the ocean. We all need water. We all need air. So all the environmental regulations that that man tried to loosen, again, that's predatory capitalism. You're basically you're empowering capitalists against at the at the um, basically at the risk of the people. So we could have a longer conversation, and we, we, especially black economists, all economists, we talk about how do you basically set up something that is, uh, how do you set up a fair society? What kind of economic system would you have in a fair society? Uh, but I would have to say that, you know, unfettered capitalism is wrong. Regulator, regulated capitalism can work, but if it's regulated. The way I put it is, like, capitalism is like a wolf trying to get surplus profits. Uh, legislation could either be, the wolf has sharp teeth. Legislation could either send a wolf to the dentist to basically file those teeth down, or send them to basically the junkyard to, to sharpen the teeth. Reg le legislation often sharpens the teeth when the goal should be to send the wolf to the dentist. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Good question. Dr. Malvo, given what you've shared with us, what would a reimagination of what black wealth look like today? Mm. Well, first of all, we would have our share. Um, and, and, and let me be clear, we are capable, absent racism, we're capable of our share. If you look at black wealth in 1880, we had $1 for every $36 that white people had. By 1910, it was $1 for every $16. Today, it's $1 for every $10. So we made more relative progress between 1880 and 1910 than between 1910 and now. So, and that's because after we began to progress, what happened? Essentially, um, economic envy, Jim Crow laws. There were laws about what we could even own. Um, and, and then one thing, and then because you demonize black people, white people could do anything to us. I mean, in my own family, we have, that we did get it from Massa, but we had some land in uh, Moss Point, Mississippi, that included a bayou which was very fish rich. And we had the land for a long time. And then at a point in time, white folks decided that the Hawkins, that was our, my mother's, mother's uh, maiden name, the Hawkins did not need to have all that land. So they went to bed one night, they woke up, the fence had moved. They had moved the fence. Now meanwhile, we were always very generous. People come and fish on our property, whatever, but the, f the fence moved. And, now the, and some of my um, great aunts, they all dead now, but back in the day, they wouldn't talk about it. It was, it was very painful for them. Um, two cousins went missing. And it went missing is a euphemism for white folks got them um, because they had gone down to the courthouse and said, da, 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 this is our land. And next thing you know, you know, where are they? Um, and finally, I looked in the 60s, and my aunt, Auntie Anna Mae, who was a trip, um, Auntie Anna Mae fussed and fussed and fussed, and she was very close with a whole lot of white people in Moss Point, Mississippi. So close, in fact, that I was sent down there because I got put out of too many high schools, long story. It wasn't my fault, see what had happened was. But anyway, uh, so anyway, I, I was, had to go down there and live with her for a year. And um, she had took pride in introducing me to this man, Mr. Dantzler, who she, and they used to own us. So I looked at the man and said, so where are my effing reparations? The next thing you know, I was climbing off the floor because I went, Shh, you can't talk to white people like that? I'm like, yes, the hell I can. Shh. <laughs> but anyway, she had gone down to the courthouse and raised also saying, and so they finally changed the street that they moved the fence on to Hawkins Lane in a tribute to our family. But they didn't get the land back. And she was happy to just get the, I mean, we were all like, mm-mm. 
but she, she was an interesting black person because you, what, when you, from her I learned that older black people, you look at them as Uncle Toms, but they really had coping strategies. They just had, they had to have coping strategies and they had to know when to talk and when not to and how to smooth, you know, the melanin deficient and, you know, how to play the game. Um, but, so, you know, we had, we can accumulate, but our accumulation has been penalized by those who have economic envy. So I would say we, what black wealth would look like is we'd have our fair share, we would also share it. We know that there are wealth inequalities within the black community and that there are many people who have pimped black people or black solidarity for their own gain. I ain't gonna call no names, but just think about some of our black billionaires who go in to get a minority set aside, did that trickle down? Did your minority set aside give anything to the broader black community? So it, 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 it would be a different kind of space, but we still live inside, like I said about swimming in dirty water. We still live inside a predatory capitalist economy. And even if we had our share, the second question would be, what would we do with our share? And how would we be different than others are about our share? Thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate you. And one of the things that I got from you is so powerful is the question, is that all? And I just respect elders like you. And um, I think another way for all of us to get more power is through knowledge from elders like you. And I was just wondering, what other ways for us to get more power? Um, some of the ideas that came to mind is like, OK, we need to know the laws. What are our rights? And uh, more financial educations, things like that. What other things do you have in mind for us? Thank you. Well, I think that we, protest works. Protest works. I give high props to Black Lives Matter and to the folks who continue to raise questions about injustice, especially around the random killings of black folks. I think that we all need to be advocating for laws that prevent arrests for traffic stops. A disproportionate number of these killings happen around a traffic stop where the reasons are nebulous. Why did you stop the person? And you stop the next thing you know they did. Um, running a red light should not be a death penalty issue. Uh, so I think that's one of the things we fight. But the other thing is economic boycotts. I mean, I really do believe that we, if we withdraw our cooperation from evil, and oppression, and it hurts them, and it hurts them, those things will change. A black man was followed and shot at in some town, Mississippi, driving a FedEx truck. FedEx should say, we're not going to that zip code anymore. And then let the white folks who are inconvenienced because no one, FedEx is not coming, let them figure out how to fix it. You know, there's a, a young man who was killed in a family dollar. Same thing. We, we, we need to start boycotting folks and making them understand economic consequences. Because if they don't understand economic, they'll just keep doing what they've been doing. And so we, we have power. Our dollars are power. Our resistance is power. Our boycotts are power. Our, you know, our protests are power. You can, I mean, if you um, stop trains from running, I'm not suggesting, I'm just saying, if you do, and the trains have to stop, everybody's going to be disconvenienced. When um, it wasn't Black Lives Matter, another group, they stopped the highway. People have to then deal with that. And the just don't do it once, do it every day. Again, I'm not advocating, I'm just saying. Uh, but we have power. Our bodies are power, our dollars are power, our influence is power. And we also have to ensure that those people we elect are responsible to us. I mean, we have people, everybody brown ain't down. You know, so we have black and brown legislators who aren't necessarily, don't necessarily have our back. Or they do when it's convenient. So we have to really share with them, These, this, this is why we elected you. We didn't elect you to go to cocktail parties in Sacramento. You know, we elected you to make change. Hi, um, thank you for being here, and this is very uh, enlightening to me. Um, 
I don't, anyway, never mind. <laughs> I have a question. The question is, where do you see black culture, the black community, and the black church in 10 years? Also, of these three areas, which one do you feel needs the most attention, focus, and rejuvenation? It's black culture, black church, and what was the third? The black community. I think all. I wouldn't prioritize, but I think the black, the, the good thing about the black church is that it's an institution. And you can, I mean, I, all churches are not, you know, revolutionary, even forward thinking, but many are. And when you have the institution, you're able, with an institution, to move more quickly than you have a group of individuals. When you talk about the black community, where and how are we organized? I mean, that's just a question. And I think in some communities, we're very organized. In others, we aren't. And often, it's very disparate. Um, you know, there are class issues in the black community. Uh, so the community is a, a source of power, but it also needs and deserves better organizing and better blueprints. Uh, in terms of black culture, I don't think that culture is something you can organize, but it's something that you can embrace. I think that our culture strengthens us. We look at our history, you look at our music, you look at that joy, that's all wonderful. But how does it get us to where we need to go in terms of, it strengthens us, but does it actually help us change things? Now the music of the movement, ain't gonna let nobody turn me around, we shall overcome, you know, uh, free Huey. You know, black is beautiful, free Huey, set our warriors free, free Huey. That's out of my era, but uh, back in the day. We have protest songs and they, you know, they lift us up, but I don't know that they help us in terms of moving towards social and economic justice. Good question, though. Give me something to think about. Hi. Well, if there's nothing else, please help me in thanking Dr. Malvo. Thank you. The hope is that in learning about some of these dynamics of resistance that you found yourself somewhere in that and can identify that and really use that agency as we all collectively try to move this work forward um, in creating sort of this anti-racist community. And so I'm just grateful for you all being here in light of the weather. We have an affinity group space um, also with some lunch at 1 p.m. So please, if you find yourself in that, please join us here at 1 p.m. But thank you again for your time. Have a blessed weekend. Take care.